today we are going to do our Bible study, and then it is actually the first of the month, so we will be doing communion afterwards. Now, the boxes on the table with all the communion stuff in, I, I put it out a little bit late, so if I could ask one person just to jump up and distribute them during, at some point during the service. Tom, you, you're by the baby, yeah, you got that. Yeah, just do it now um, for the introduction. Everyone can just take one, and then we'll have that at the end, and we'll do another <coughs> song after the study. So this is it. This is Easter. We've had the Passion Week, and uh, Passion Week is one of my favourite weeks as you read along every day in the upcoming to this wonderful Friday and Sunday that we have had. It's a time when millions of people around the globe are celebrating the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's really no other time like it throughout the whole calendar. And I say that because the resurrection and the death of Christ are the very heart of of our lives, of the message we preach. They are the reason that we do everything we do. Now, many of us simply use the greeting Happy Easter, and we all understand what we mean when we say that. But I'd like us this morning just to really retrace our ancient roots and partake of one of the ancient Christian greetings. We have record of it going back to at least the third century. You'll find it said across most of the Christian world today. Actually, it's usually lost maybe in the evangelical church, but I've had a few people say it to me this morning. So I would say Christ is risen. That is how you greet someone on Easter morning. And the return reply is, he is risen indeed. And you'll find that said over most of the world, the Christian world today. So I say Christ is risen. risen indeed. I'll be saying that a few times throughout this sermon, so please uh, feel free to reply if you want to. As a community of believers, we need to greet each other this way because we want to foster and be a community that glories in the resurrection and the cross. You see, because ultimately, it all comes down to this day. As believers, everything we do, everything we've toiled for, all those times that we've laboured, all the setbacks, all the disappointments, all of the services, the rotors, the teardowns, the endless hours of driving to and from church, the Bible studies, the meetings, the times we've had at work where we felt alone, the times that we may have been ostracised at work, the times that we've really just rested and cast all our cares upon Christ, that hope we have of victory, the joy of fellowship, the certainty we have of being with him in the future, all of that comes down to this day. Everything in our lives is given meaning by what happened on Easter Sunday. We must look at all of these things in light of the resurrection of Christ. He is the motivating factor behind all of our Christian service, and if he is not risen, then we are above all men to be pitied. Now, we shall talk about these truths this Easter morning. So Christ is risen. You see, without this truth, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we did on Good Friday is utterly meaningless. And I say that frankly because that is true. If Christ did not rise, he is still dead in his sins. We remain dead in our sins if Christ did not rise. As the Apostle Paul puts it, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, your faith is also vain. If the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men to be pitied. You understand the seriousness of what he's getting at here and how essential the resurrection is to our faith. And we stand here today celebrating in a succession dating right back to that first morning when Mary Magdalene came to the empty tomb that Christ, in fact, did rise. And because of that, he is the only hope for this world. There's a famous story by Billy Graham when he was asked to go and have a meeting with Konrad Adenauer, who was the first chancellor of the German Republic. He was the man tasked with really rebuilding Germany after the war, and the, the man who really rebuilt Germany's relationship with the Western European nations at that time. Uh, I'll read it to you from Billy Graham's own words. He says, I was invited to have coffee one morning with Konrad Adenauer before he retired as the Chancellor of Germany. When I walked in, I expected to meet a tall, stiff, formal man who might even be embarrassed if I brought up the subject of religion. After the greeting, the Chancellor suddenly turned to me and he said, Mr. Graham, what is the most important thing in the world? Before I could answer, he had answered his own question, and he said, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is alive, then there is hope for the world. If Jesus Christ is in the grave, then I don't see the slightest glimmer of hope on the horizon. And then he amazed me by saying that he believed the resurrection of Christ was one of the best attested facts of history, 
And he said, when I leave office, I intend to spend the rest of my life gathering proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, it was the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that called those disciples on that morning to go out as revolutionaries and turn the world upside down for Christ. They were preaching that Christ is alive. That was the centre of their message. It's the centre of our message. It's the very reason we're all sitting here this morning. However, I believe it's also too easy to maybe focus. We focus so much on the cross, and again, you can never focus too much on the cross, but quite often you'll find that we kind of add the resurrection onto that. I've heard many gospel presentations where we, we, we focus on the cross, uh, but sometimes the resurrection is not even really mentioned. However, if you go through the book of Acts and you look at the sermons that those apostles gave in that early time where they were taking the gospel, they always preached the resurrection. It was the very heart and centre of apostolic preaching. Now, I think in our culture, 20, 21st century, it's hard sometimes to preach the miraculous. We feel like we maybe need to combat and answer every naturalistic objection to things like the resurrection before we can even have a good conversation. Now, I do firmly believe that you can actually present a very strong historical case using historical methods and evidences for the resurrection. It has strong explanatory power for the existence of the church, for the transformation of the apostles' lives, and for many things that you can look at like that, which are all classed under the category of historical investigation. However, that's really not what I want to focus on this morning. For me, the story of God becoming man, to die at the hands of the very ones he created on a cross, tasting death for all men, to be raised to life again, defeating death in the process, is quite literally the most amazing story that has ever been told and will ever be told. And that's what I want to look at with you this morning. The narrative of the first Easter and what it means for us. So let's journey back to the first century. Let's immerse ourselves in the events that led up to this day. Now, as a caveat before we get into that, I'll remind you that Good Friday and Easter originally corresponded to the Jewish feasts of Passover and First Fruits. It is an anomaly of history of how they were separated and never on the same day. But just so you all know, theologically, we're dealing with Passover and we're dealing with First Fruits. That's another study altogether, but I've just let you know that is the situation. So let's go back to first century Israel. As the nation prepared to celebrate the Passover, and this was a feast where everyone was required to head up to Jerusalem, so the city of Jerusalem would have been filling with visitors and pilgrims from all over the world. Do you remember, we, we read in the scriptures, don't we, of how families would come with, in caravans, they called it, trains of families, and they would lodge in any relatives' houses that they had, anywhere that would rent them a room in Jerusalem, and the houses were all built on top of each other. It was just, the, the city would have been absolutely bursting at the seams, the marketplaces, people would have been selling. You can imagine what that was like. They were, everyone was going up to Jerusalem. However, there was also another reason why this Passover was going to be different than all other Passovers. The messianic fervor in Jerusalem had reached its peak. You see, there'd been a traveling rabbi wandering around the land of Israel, doing miracles, making audacious claims to deity to be the long-awaited Mashiach, Messiah. And he was in Israel at this time, and people had heard about him. There was a buzz. People were coming to see him. They were going to hear his teaching, follow him around, and do what they did with the rabbis in those days. People wanted to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Now, the leadership of Israel at that time also knew about how much the people wanted to hear Jesus, and that, of course, created great tension they anticipated great crowds, and they wanted to know how to handle the situation without causing too much disruption. Of course, it was controlled by Pilate. At this time in history, Pilate was on sort of a blacklist of the Roman governors at the time. He'd had a few problems, and he, was been, he had been told at this time, one more riot, and we'll hold you accountable. So his centurions would have been patrolling, and they would have quashed any sign of a breach of the peace at this time. So there was tension in the air with the people, there was tension with the religious leaders, and there was a heavy hand with the Roman centurions at this time, at the same time that the population of Jerusalem would have been bursting at the seams. The tension and anticipation in the air were palpable. A week ago today, we called it Palm Sunday, 
Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, fulfilling the ancient prophecies of Zechariah. You remember the story, the people threw their coats on the ground before him, and that his disciples began to shout that messianic greeting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. If you can imagine the commotion of a full city, the middle of the busy streets, the rabbi that everyone's been talking about enters Jerusalem to the same cries that the scriptures say are to be reserved for the messianic king. You can imagine what the leaders felt of Israel when they saw that, those Pharisees who had rejected his messiahship, who wanted the people to look to them as the leadership of Israel. The leaders of Israel, they came to him and they were aghast and they said, instruct your disciples to stop shouting that greeting. And he turned and he said to them, if these become silent, then even the stones will cry out. And as Jesus approached Jerusalem, it says that he wept over the city. He then entered the temple and again, he caused a scene. He just, just he threw over the tables of the people selling money in his father's house. And he also condemned the leaders at that time by that very act. The next day, all those religious leaders of Israel, some of them already planning how to destroy him. Of course, they were unable to at this time because of the great throngs of people that were following him and his popularity. So they decided to confront him, to examine him with questions, to try and trip him up mentally, intellectually, to show that he could not be the Messiah of Israel. All of them had a go, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, even the Herodians got in on this. However, he answered all their questions impeccably. And then he told that parable, that famous parable of the vineyard that spoke to Israel at that time, the one with the, the vineyard owner, and it was given to tenants, and they, they killed the owner's messengers, and then they killed the owner's son. And of course, the Pharisees, it says in the scripture, doesn't it, the Pharisees knew that he was speaking that parable against them. And once again, in the eyes of the public, by the teaching of this itinerant rabbi, the leaders of Israel had been embarrassed, shamed, condemned, and humiliated. And they grew more determined to put him to death each day. Now remember, there are spiritual forces working behind the scenes here too. If the resurrection proves anything, it's that our worldview is a supernatural worldview. It is not a naturalistic worldview. There are spiritual forces in this world. And we see this in the narrative of the Bible where it, where it says that Satan entered Judas. Twice we read that term, Satan entered Judas and energized him with the spiritual power to go and betray Jesus. So whilst the throngs of worshippers and pilgrims are going about their business, getting ready for the sacrifices, following Jesus, hearing him teach, excited about the festival. It was a time, a joyous time, the festival. There are those lurking in the shadows at night, making agreements how they might destroy this rabbi. Then as the first day of the great feast approach, thousands of pilgrims focused on purchasing their Paschal lambs, their sacrifices, bringing them to the priests in the temple. This was probably the biggest day of the year, maybe for the priests, except for uh, the Day of Atonement. They had thousands of sacrifices that they were going to have to deal with up there. Jesus instructed Peter and John to go and find a place where they could have their last supper, the Passover Seder meal. And we know the story of the upper room. And during that Seder, Jesus tells them that he will be handed over soon to suffer and that one of them who is there in their midst right now will betray them. And you can imagine how that went down with this intimate group of disciples they started looking at each other, probably judging each other, saying, you've done this, you did this, you're going to be the one. And obviously it filled the room again with tension, I would imagine. And then after that Seder, uh, he picked up a piece of bread and wine and he instituted that act of communion. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after he took the cup and after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The same thing that we commemorate every time we take that. Then after the Seder had finished, after singing a couple of messianic psalms, as is the custom at Passover, he went out down the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as you know, he sat amongst those ancient olive trees there in Gethsemane. He agonized in prayer, went away on his own, sweating great drops of blood about what he had to go through. And in the end, we have those famous words, not as I will, but as you will. And then we witness, sorry, the biggest betrayal in history. The name Judas has forever been associated with betrayal since this night. You could imagine them there in the garden as it's getting dark now, praying. The disciples are there too. They've already been sleeping and Jesus has condemned them for that a little bit. And now we have Judas approaching and he has with him a big group of basically armed thugs. 
and high priest, temple guards. And he walks up to Jesus and he kisses him on the cheek and he says, Hail, Rabbi. And this is his symbol to the guards of who to arrest. But Jesus says to him, Judas, Jesus says to him, Judas, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss. Do what you've come to do. And then he was led away to face his accusers. And through the night, he had these clandestine, very illegal trials. He was led to the high priests, where the scribes who were there, who had been plotting against him, were the ones in the audience. He had no friends in that audience. Peter followed at a distance. And as they began to falsely accuse Peter of knowing Jesus, you remember the story, Peter denied him three times. And he heard that rooster crow. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Jesus was taken to the Sanhedrin, where again he was faced more humiliation. They said to him, are you the son of God? He said, yes, I am. Finally, they took him to the governor, Pilate, who asked him, are you king of the Jews? And he said, it is as you say. It was daytime now as the sun was approaching. Crowds had gathered. These were the same people who days before had been listening to him teaching, probably unaware of everything that had transpired during that night. Pilate could find no guilt, so he passed him on to Herod. Herod's Roman soldiers mocked him again, beat him, slapped him, spat on him, did all that they did to him, and obviously sent him back to Pilate, ultimately. Pilate was unable to convince the crowds that he was innocent. As is the custom at the Passover, Pilate offered them a prisoner, Barabbas or Jesus, to be released. And now the crowd stirred up at the instigation of the priests and the leaders of Israel. They shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And he said, so be it. His blood be on your head. Then these soldiers, they stripped the Lord naked. They put their crown of thorns on him and they continued to mock him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they continued to spit on him. And then they marched him out of the city, carrying his cross to the place called Golgotha. And there they crucified the Lord of glory. And you remember the scene. Jesus is hanging on that cross. He has those seven famous statements that he says. He says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And there the Lord of glory hung for hours. And at around the sixth hour, this is about noon, the heavenly Father dimmed the lights of the earth and it went black. And Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And at that moment it says that the centurions and everyone who watched felt fear come upon them because they knew that something, there was something different about this death than all the other people they'd seen crucified by the Romans over the years. And as the crowds dispersed, the body was taken down. That secret disciple, Joseph of Arimathea, he took the body, he wrapped it, and he placed it in his own family grave. The entrance was blocked and guarded. And this is there, the disciples dispersed, all of their hopes probably dashed. This festival season of joy had turned to a season of mourning, and fear overtook them. And then we have Sunday, where we see those faithful women wanting to perform one last act of devotion for their Lord. They prepared those spices to anoint his body. They headed out early to the tomb Sunday morning as the sun was rising. They came to the grave, and as they got there, the earth shook, and the angels appeared to roll away the stone, shining bright as the sun. And the guards fell to the ground in fear, and the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, for he is risen. And then he says, go and tell the disciples. And that has really been the message of the church ever since. And is not that really the greatest story you've ever heard? He is risen, he is not here, for he is risen. And at that point we say, Christ is risen. He is risen Amen. See, there is something about this story, and I hope just by that recap that your hearts sort of build up with the expectation as you get to that fateful morning. It makes our hearts sing for joy if we know the Lord. This is the story of Easter. And now I want to turn and examine a few theological truths that are relevant, that come from this story. We want to look at what is happening behind the scenes of this narrative. We read this narrative uh, in the Gospels as a narrative in many ways. The events of the cross and resurrection cannot be disconnected from one another. So we want to understand what happened at the cross. We want to understand what is happening at the resurrection. Now, to best understand the Gospels, you read the divine commentary that we have on the Gospels. That is called the epistles, basically. 
those people who were witness, who were there, and wrote about what it meant for us theologically. So let's turn to Colossians chapter 2 for our first text. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. This is looking at the events of Good Friday, we would say, the cross. But like I said, remember, these two things are very much together. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having cancelled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. There's just two verses here. We learn so much about the cross, about what happened, about our state in this world, our human condition. It says that we are dead in our transgressions, dead in our sins. This ultimately means that we are separated from God. Our relationship with our Creator has been severed by the presence of sin. Isaiah 59 verse 2, your sins have caused a separation between you and your God. But we also learn, writing in this same verse, he says, you're dead in your transgressions, but then he also says, but you have been made alive. So writing to this body of believers at Colossae, he says you have been made alive and your sins have in fact been forgiven. He phrases it in a very unusual way. The certificate of debt against us has been taken away. It's like an accounting term. This is the record of sins and the payment due for those sins against us that is causing us to be separated from God. We know elsewhere that the wages, what we deserve for our sin is quite literally death or the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But he says the wages, the certificate of debt that is built up against you, it has been removed and you have been made alive again. These these records, they are basically our spiritual death. This is what keeps us in bondage to sin. This is what keeps us under the power of Satan. But I want you to notice very specifically how it was defeated, how this debt was cancelled, how our account was balanced. It says he took it out of the way, he cancelled it by nailing it to the cross. That is why the cross is so important. Whenever you hear that question, why did Jesus have to die? This is the answer right here. No one else did what Jesus did. No one else had that debt against us nailed to his cross. That's why his death was different to every other crucifixion that those people had seen at that time. That's why the Father dimmed the lights. That's why everyone knew that something different had just been happened here. The cross was different. Jesus' cross. He took it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It was on that cross that this great transaction occurred, that hill in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, that our forgiveness and our way to the Father was opened and accomplished. Here, the victory was won. This is why Jesus could cry out at the end of of that time on the cross, it is finished. That's what he's referring to. Now look again at verse 15. I think... I'm going to read it to you now out of a different version. This is the amplified version. Now, I'm not particularly a fan of, of some of these paraphrased versions, but sometimes they do capture, the, capture it very well. Uh, it's probably different to what you're going to read on the screen now, so listen to what I'm saying. This is verse 15 again. He says, When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. What's going on here? I want to just explain this a little bit to you because it gives us a very good um, view behind the scenes to what is happening in the spiritual realm at this time. Remember, Rome was an honour and shame culture, as was much of the world at that time. And the Romans would have a shaming ritual. So whenever the Romans had a great victory, a military battle... They would have a parade, a procession, a victory procession, whereby they would exhibit all of the plundered treasures of the nation that they just conquered. They would have the victor, the the Roman general usually, who led the campaign, or or the emperor, and they would be at the front of this procession. And then you'd have all the soldiers who fought in the battle, and then you'd have the soldiers carrying the plundered treasure from the conquered nation, and then you'd have the slaves from the conquered nation who were being led in chains, and right at the back of that, you would have the conquered king, if he was still alive, the general, and he would be naked, and he would be stripped at the back of that procession. It was an ultimate shame and honour process, thereby you honour yourselves as the victor, and you shame the defeated nation. 
Paul here is making use of that imagery that all of these people in the world at this time would have known about. In Jesus, God did what a Roman general would do at the end of that triumphal procession. That's why it says it there in the Amplified Version. He exhibited them as captives in his triumphal procession. At the cross, all the spiritual forces were actually being led in a procession by the victor. And they were the defeated nation. They were the ones at the end. They were in captive. Satan right at the back, humiliated. Christ at the front, the victor. This is what is happening in the heavenlies. It's very powerful imagery that we see here Paul utilising in the book of Colossians. And this is why the devil hates the cross. It disarmed him and it humiliated him. And it stands forever as a symbol of victory over the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And it stands forever as a testimony to God's love for sinners. We need both of those elements of the cross. You see, what was accomplished on the cross... All of those things we've just looked at, the spiritual victories, the cancelling of our debt, nailing it to the cross, it was accomplished on the cross, but it was only secured three days later by the resurrection. It was the resurrection that secured what he purchased on the cross. That's why you can never separate the two. He took away the power of death from Satan with the resurrection, and quite simply, today is the day that the revolution began. You see, the world had been Satan's domain. You could think of him as an occupying power. He was actually given that dominion by Adam when sin entered this world all those years ago, and his most powerful weapon had been death, and he had held the power of death in his hand in many ways since then, keeping everyone in bondage to sin. But the resurrection took away his only card. Death has been defeated, and all things have been placed under the authority of Christ. Remember in the book of Romans, it says that Jesus, who, declared, who was declared to be the Son of God by power through the resurrection from the dead. It's such an important piece of our theology. The resurrection confirmed everything that Jesus did, said, and taught. This is why we don't preach the cross apart from the resurrection. Theologically speaking, they are useless without each other. They are very much two sides of the same coin. Now, Easter is a time of wonder, and it's a time of joy as we marvel at the fact that someone defeated death in that way and everything that happened at this time. The realisation of Christ, that he is the risen Lord, is the very beating heart of the Christian faith, and thus the very heartbeat of our own lives too. Without it, we are above all men to be pitied. What was the reaction of those two Marys who were the first to learn this fact on that Easter morning? It says they left the tomb quickly with fear and with great joy and they ran to tell the disciples. This twofold element that we see here, fear. We cannot deny it is an awesome thing, the one who has power over death. You know, we say it so often in the Christian church, think about it, the resurrected Lord. He defeated death that day, that morning and he forever took it out of the power Satan, basically. And then joy. Why did he do that? He did that for us. He did it for us, so that we could be joined together with him again in relationship, so that we shall ultimately live with him. You see, the thought of the resurrected Lord should cause us unspeakable joy, and we need to dwell on this subject. It's one of those things, I've been dwelling on it all week, and it's been extremely refreshing. If things are getting you down... What do you do? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. If lockdowns are getting you down, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Whatever you may be going through in your your life, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You see what I mean? That is one of the things that we need to keep at the front and centre of our Christian life. Let's have a look how this event impacted Peter. Turn with me to 1 Peter 1. One Peter one verses three to five, in the beginning of Peter's epistle, and we know, remember, Peter obviously was that first disciple when he heard the news, he ran straight to the tomb. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
He says we are born again to a living hope through the resurrections. You see, as Christians, we do not adhere just to some religious code, some moral system of ethics, some seven-step program, uh, some system of meditation and breathing to bring us peace. We have a living hope. This is something substantial. It is vibrant with life and power, and ultimately it's personal because it is none other than the risen Lord. The New Testament does not offer vague optimism that if we all just do our bit, things will get better. It does not offer the uncertain enthusiasm that politicians offer us and have offered since the days of the Roman Empire. We have a living hope. Now, this does not minimise the difficulties and trials of life. The purpose, in fact, of Peter writing was to this church at the time was these people were going through some very tough times. His point was to show that no matter how hard it got and how dark life can get on occasion in this world, for believers... Ultimately, we will triumph because we have a living hope. Thus, it is a hope that will sustain us. It will enable us not only to endure in this world, but actually to be more than conquerors through him who loved us. It says we are born again, or regenerated, your Bibles might say, unto a living hope. Unless you are born again, you do not have this hope. That is the state of the the fact of the matter. It says in Ephesians, doesn't it, that the natural man is without Christ, having no hope, in this world and without God in this world. But Peter here is writing to these Christians and he says, you have been born again through a living hope. These are the same people like he's writing to in Colossians. Your certificate of debt has been cancelled out. It's been taken away, having nailed it to the cross. And through the resurrection, he has confirmed that you are now born again to a living hope. We as Christians are rich in this world, regardless of what we have or where we are in the physical world around us. We have a living hope. The resurrected Lord guarantees that one day we will be resurrected with him. It says there, doesn't it, to obtain, verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, will not fade away and reserved for you in heaven. And ultimately, this is the message of Easter. Christ is risen. He has defeated every enemy. God has put all things under his feet. He is our forerunner. He has gone to prepare a place for us and he will come again to receive us to himself. And we shall reign with him as kings and priests. And it even says that we shall judge the world with him. This is Christ's guarantee. And there is nothing that can stand in its way or stop it being accomplished. Can Satan? No. He was defeated on that cross. Think of the Roman processional. He was at the end of that processional, humiliated. Can death? No longer. He conquered death. That's what this day is about. Can hell? No. Through Christ, he has opened the way to heaven for all men. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. You see, that greeting that we do, it proclaims loudly to this world that he has conquered every enemy, he has vanquished every foe, and he has risen triumphantly from the grave. And we know from the book of Romans that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, things present, things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And that means all of those things are not able either to prevent the coming of his kingdom in his glory because he is ultimately the king of kings and he is the lord of lords he is our living hope and we see this vision of who he is in the first chapter of revelation do you remember how do we think of this living hope he is the one whose head and hair are white like wool like snow his eyes are like a flame of fire his feet were like burnished bronze and he was glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And this living hope is the one who proclaimed to us, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. He has the keys of death and Hades. He is the living hope. This is the living hope that we celebrate this Easter day. And whether you need to cry out in all the brokenness and despair of your life, or whether you need to just give thanks for the joy and praise and thanksgiving that you you have at this moment in life, we need to take hold of that inheritance that he purchased for us, that living hope that is undefiled, that will not fade away. This is the true inheritance of the Christian. It is the living hope. It is Jesus Christ himself. This is Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. So what I want us to do now, if we could get our communion elements, I'm going to just...
give us a couple of minutes in our own hearts as we pray, and then I'll lead us in communion, and then we're going to have more worship after that. That's the idea. Actually, do you know what? It, rather than me, if someone from the audience could pray for the bread and pray for the cup, um, just feel, feel free to do that, and then I'll lead us after that. Take the bread together. Someone can please pray for the wine. Take together. Amen. Let's praise the Lord.
Christmas rejoice.